Okay, so just a little bit of review before we, we started a problem, we didn't finish it, so we're gonna finish that today. So just a little bit of review. So what we're working on, um, first, first derivative test, right? First derivative test will tell us a couple things. First thing, it'll tell us where the original function is increasing and where it is decreasing, right? Where it's got a positive slope, where it has a negative slope. It'll also tell us where the derivative has a zero slope, right? Where it has a zero slope or an undefined slope. We call those critical points or critical values because that's where maximum and minimums are, okay? So that's what we've been working on now. All right, so let's look at the problem we left off on. This one right here, number three. Okay, so we found the first derivative. Um, and then we set the top equal to zero and we set the bottom equal to zero separately. Can someone remind me why we did that separately? Why was it necessary to do it separately instead of all in one? Yeah, Tony? Mm -hmm, exactly. The bottom will tell me where it is undefined, right? Critical point. The top setting it equal to zero, the numerator, that'll tell me where it's equal to zero. Critical point, okay? So when we did this, we were kind of running low on time. The first one, you could solve it. So it was difference of squares, right? Or you could solve it just isolating X. You can solve it this way too. You can say X squared minus four equals zero. Add four to both sides. The problem is when people do this, this method, they're like, oh, done. Well, no, because the, the, the um, square root of four is two, but it's also negative two, right? So if you remember that, that's an okay method, but sometimes you forget it. Okay, so either one works. Either one works. This guy here, we talked about, so let's say we talked about why this guy wouldn't work, why there's no number in there, but let's solve it. So to solve it, I would take the square root, right? Take the square root of both sides to get rid of that root. So then I got x squared plus four equals zero. And then I would do the same thing, right? This is not difference of squares, so I can't do difference of squares, but I can subtract two from four from both sides, right? What's the square root? If I take the square root of both sides, what's the square root of negative four? Is it two, negative two, both, none? What is what is the square root of negative four? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, why is it, what's an I mean? What is the I mean, Sebastian? Imaginary. Yeah, imaginary, right? There is no number. There is no number that I can put in my calculator that's on the number line that if I multiply by itself will give me negative four, right? It's imaginary. And in this class, we don't deal with imaginary. Math three, we deal with imaginary all the time. But in this class, imaginary, we're, we don't tackle that. So if it's imaginary, we're not worried about it, okay? And then again, yesterday I talked about it. There was no number I can plug in for X. There's no number I can plug in for X that would give me zero. I can plug in negative four. That would give me positive 16 plus four is 20. Squared is 400, right? There's no number positive, negative, decimal fraction, doesn't matter what the number is. There's no number I can plug in here for X that would ever equal zero because we square it first and then I add four and then I square it again. So it's gonna make it a bigger positive. There's no way, even if I plug in zero, it'd still be 16. The smallest I can get it to be is 16, okay? So the only two critical values are negative two and positive two. Those are the two I'm going to use to figure out where it's increasing, where it's decreasing, okay? So let me set up my number line. Negative two, positive two. Okay. Okay, so 
how do I figure out where it's increasing and where it's decreasing? What did we do the last, for example one and example two? How did we figure that out? What did we do? What did we do to figure out whether it's a plus or a minus pain? Mm -hmm. We plugged it into the derivative. We plugged in values that were outside or in between, right? Outside, in between, outside, right? Any number that falls outside of this, less than negative two, or in between negative two and two, or greater than two, we plug in. Okay, so I'm gonna do that over here. So you know what, let me move my number line down here because I'm running out of space. So the first thing is to the left. So I'll plug in the, just to show you any number, usually I pick a number that's close to negative two, but just to show you, I'm gonna pick negative 10. Just to show you that any number, any value will work. So if I plug in negative 10 to the derivative, the derivative is x squared minus four over x squared plus four squared. Again, I'm just looking for a positive or a negative. I don't care what the number is. I just want it to be a positive or a negative to know. So the top, the top negative 10 squared is positive minus four is still positive. So I'm going to get a positive on top. On the bottom, we all we talked about this, I'm always going to get a positive on the bottom. I'm always going to get a positive because I square it, add four and then square it again. So a positive divided by a positive makes a positive. Okay. So now I'm gonna do the middle. Zero is always, if you can use zero, use zero. Easier to use than any other term, any other number we have, because a lot of stuff cancels out. Okay, so I'm gonna plug in zero. On top, I get a negative number. On bottom, we always said it's always gonna be a positive number. It's always gonna be a positive number. There's no number I can plug into the bottom that would ever give me a zero or a negative number, right? So it's always gonna be a positive number. So that means a negative divided by a positive is a negative. And don't assume that after two is gonna be positive. Check it, actually check it. Because sometimes as we get into this, it'll stay negative, right? And I'll tell you what that means when we do second, when we, there is, there's a second derivative test we'll, we'll talk about later. When we do that, I'll show you some of those. So don't assume that, oh, it's just, it's a pattern, right? It's a pattern, positive, negative. That means this has to be positive. More than likely it's gonna be positive, but there are some cases where it stays negative. Okay. It's what we call an inflection point, which we'll, which we'll see more and more as we do this. So always check it. Okay. So I'll try three. So three squared minus four over three squared plus four squared. The bottom's going to be positive. And the top is nine minus four, which is five. So it's gonna be positive. Okay. Okay, so now we have to figure out. So the question was, uh, let's see here. So we have to write all of this. We have to find the critical numbers. Where is it increasing? Where is it decreasing? and all relative extrema. Okay, so the critical values we've already found. Negative two and positive two. Okay. Increasing and decreasing. All right, let's write that right here.
increasing. Anywhere there's a plus, that's where I'm increasing. So over here, that means negative infinity. So from negative infinity up to two, negative two, it's increasing. Or from two to positive infinity. That's where the pluses are. Where is it decreasing? It's decreasing in the middle from negative two to positive two. Okay. The last thing I have to do is figure out where the relative maximums and minimums are. If there are any, if there aren't, say there aren't. Okay. So relative max. Relative min. Okay, so if it's increasing, if the function is increasing before two, negative two, and then decreasing after it, that's going to make a maximum. So we have a maximum at negative two. And then if we if the function was decreasing in between negative two and two, and then at two, it turned to increasing positive slope, that means at two, it's going to have a minimum. Again, how do we, what if they want the point? Sometimes I've seen they said, give me the point at which there's a relative maximum or minimum. How would I, I'm not doing that here, but how would I do that? How would I figure out, I think we talked about this yesterday too. What if they want the actual point at which there is a relative maximum or minimum? What would I do? Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Plug them into the original. So this is going to be negative two comma something. Positive two comma something. Okay, plug it into the original, not the derivative. We only plug into the derivative for the first derivative test. Everything else we plug into the original. All right. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about in these notes, which the last thing that covers is when they want you to be more specific about the maximum and minimums. Here, the next three questions, they want us to find the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum. Before, we were just finding the relative. We were just finding the relative. It could have been the absolute, but we don't know that for sure. So what we have to do now is figure out overall, where's the highest point, where is the lowest point, right? So some more stuff. Extreme value theorem states that if a function is continuous on a closed interval, then it must have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum at least once. Okay, so it has to have one if it's continuous. The minimum and maximum of a function on an interval are the extreme values or extrema of the function on the interval. The maximum and minimum on an interval are also called the absolute or global maximum or minimum. On the interval, extrema can occur at interior points or endpoints of an interval. That's big right here because that's what we're going to check. It can happen inside the interval or on the edges of the interval. So where are we going to check? Three places we're going to check. The start of the interval, the end of the interval, and anywhere there's a critical point within the interval. OK? So when we say what's the absolute max, we're just talking about the y value. We're just talking about the y value. OK? So it's similar to what we've been doing, but a little different, a little bit different. OK, so let's look at number four. So number four, similar to what the questions we've just talked about, right? 
The only difference is now it wants an absolute maximum, absolute highest point. And they give us an interval. They say, hey, I only want you to look from negative five to negative one. I don't want you to look less than negative five, and I don't want you to look at greater than negative one. Okay, just keep it there. Notice how they put brackets, no parentheses. We've been using parentheses. What do the brackets mean? What's the difference between brackets and parentheses? Does anyone remember? Hmm? Brackets mean they include, right? Negative five, we gonna, we're gonna use negative five, okay? We're gonna use negative one and everything in between. Parentheses mean everything in between. So look at what we did here. When I did increasing and decreasing, I'm not including negative infinity. Negative infinity is not a number, it's an idea. We don't know what negative infinity looks like. We just know at the end of the path, there's gonna be something that's really, really, really small, right? So that's why I use parentheses. parentheses. At negative two, at negative two, the, um, the um, derivative is zero. So I don't wanna include negative two everything less than negative two on a clue. So that's why I put parentheses there. If you don't want to include the number, you put parentheses. If you want to include the number, you put brackets. Okay. That's what those mean. Okay. So first thing we got to do, find derivative. Anytime we're finding maximum and minimums, we need a derivative. Doesn't matter if it's absolute or if it's relative, doesn't matter. Okay, so we're going to find the derivative. Okay. Now that we found the derivative, we need to find the critical points. Anytime you're finding relative maximum, or any kind of maximum or minimum, find the derivative, find the critical values. Okay, so let's do that. Set it equal to zero. Now this derivative is a quadratic. So for a quadratic or a trinomial, we're gonna factor it. The first step, it's written right there. Set it equal to zero, it's already done. Second step, factor out a GCF. Is there a GCF between all three terms? Mm -hmm. What is that GCF? Just a regular three, right? Just a regular three. So I get x squared plus six x plus nine. Okay, and then we factor. So there's different ways to factor. Some people use the x, some people don't. We're gonna multiply a times c. So within there, a is one, c is nine. And then we have to figure out the two numbers that add to be b. Uh, so the two numbers that multiply to be nine and add up to be six, three and three. So we're gonna write those down. X plus three, X plus three. Okay. How do I use that to solve now? Well, what do I do to solve? That's factored. It's factored as far as it can go. But what do I do to solve? What's the extra step to solve? What's the extra step to solve? Set every, yep, set everything equal to zero. So zero equal to three, zero equal to x plus three, zero equal to x plus three. I'm gonna get the same answer for the last two since they're the same. Subtract three from both sides, subtract three from both sides. So I get negative three twice. And then over here, there's nothing to do over here. Over here, there's nothing to do. 
I can't divide, I can't multiply, I can't add or anything. But it's important to do that because to note that, hey, these are not equal. So this guy's not gonna give me a solution. I only need two because it's a quadratic and I got my two, three and three. Okay, so these are my critical values or critical numbers or critical points, however they, okay. I got my critical points. So now what I gotta do is I gotta check to see if those are maximums or, or sorry, it's the same point. So are, is it a maximum? Is it a minimum? Which one is it? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm not going to use the first derivative test because I gotta use, I gotta find the absolute. So what are the three places I'm gonna check? What are the three places I need to check for absolute maximums or minimums? Uh huh. And, yep, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna check those three. So over here, I'm gonna set up a X, Y table. or since they use f of x, I'm gonna use x and f of x. There's three points I'm gonna check, exactly like Isabella said. I'm gonna check the beginning, the end, and any critical value that I got. Whichever has the highest y value, is the absolute max. Whichever has the lowest y value is the absolute min, okay? So negative five, where am I gonna plug in negative five? The original, good, the original, not, the only time we plug into the derivative is when we're using the first derivative test. I'm not doing that right now because I don't need to find relative maximum and minimums. I wanna find out if it's the highest point or the lowest point. Okay, so I'm gonna plug in five to the original. I'm gonna plug in negative one to the original and I'm gonna plug in negative three to the original. So negative five to the original. I need an actual number here. I don't wanna know if it's positive or negative, great. I need an actual number here because I'm gonna compare it to the other two. Okay, so negative five times itself three times is negative 125. Uh, negative five squared is 25 times nine is 225. Yeah, 225. 27 times five. Negative 135 plus three. Okay, so when I combine, I get 100 minus 135 plus three, which is negative 135, negative 35 plus three is negative 33, negative 32. So I'm gonna go put that on my table, negative 32. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing for negative one now.
negative 16. Okay, so I'm going to go put that on my table. And then the last one I'm going to check is negative 3. So negative 27 plus 81 minus 72, no, 71, no, 81, yes, thank you, plus 3. So luckily the 81s looks like they're going to go away. So it's 81 minus 81, and then I get negative 24. Okay. Now we're going to compare. Which one has the highest y value? Which one has the lowest y value? So it looks like the highest y value is negative 1, right? Let me highlight that one. Looks like this guy right here is the absolute max. Right, it's the absolute max because it has the highest y value. Right, and then it looks like the top one is the absolute minimum. Because it, ha because it has the lowest y value. And then negative 3, negative 24, it's probably a relative maximum or minimum. It's probably just a relative, which we don't care about for this problem because all we need to define was the absolute, right? So actually, this question only asks for the absolute max, right? So we would only give negative 1, negative 16, or just negative 16. Okay, that's the one that we would, that's the only one with the green one that we would need. Okay, so it's a little different. When you're finding the absolute, you don't need to do the first derivative test. Find the critical values, and then check. Check the beginning of the interval, the end of the interval, and any critical values. Any critical values. So if I would have had more critical values, I would need to check those two. All right. Okay, so check. Try number five. Try number five. Okay, so I found the first derivative, uh, which was negative 4x to the third plus 12x squared. That's the first derivative. Set it equal to zero. It's a binomial, so I factored out the biggest thing I could, which was 4x squared. When I factored that out, I set those both equal to zero. I got three as one answer and plus or minus zero as another answer, but plus or minus zero is the same number, just zero. So 0, 3, I got to check because those are the critical values. And then the beginning and end of the interval. Okay. So I plug them into the original. Well, the easiest one to do is 0 because everything cancels out. The only thing that's left is 8. So 0, 8. That's the first part. And then so when I plug in negative 2, be careful when you plug in negative 2 because a lot of people think, oh, it's already negative, so it becomes positive. No. The only thing we're taking away is that is that x. So the negative stays. And it's, it's like a negative 1. It's really like a negative 1 times whatever I get. Okay? So be careful there. So negative 2 to the 4th, negative 2 to the 4th is 16 times negative 1 is negative 16 uh minus because it's going to be negative two to the third is negative eight times four is negative 32 so it's minus 32 plus eight so you get uh negative 
So let me see. Negative eight, negative 40. Negative 40. So negative two, negative 40. Okay, the next one is positive four. So four to the fourth, 256. So negative 256 plus 256. Because 4 cubed is 64 times another 4 is 256 plus 8. So this guy, these two cancel out, and you're left with a positive 8. Okay. And then the last one, plug in 3. So 3 to the 4th is 81, so negative 81. Uh, 27 times 4, what is 27 times 4? I feel like I just did that. 27 times 4, 108 plus 8. So you get 27 plus 8, which is 35. 35. Take stock of what we got. Now they only want the minimum. They only want the minimum. So we look for the last one, the lowest one. The lowest guy here is this guy here. The lowest Y value, I should say. The lowest Y value. So that is going to be my absolute minimum. Absolute minimum. They didn't ask for my absolute max, but it's already theirs. So might as well note it. That's my absolute max. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, so let's do the last problem. The last thing we do is the last one, number six. It's the same type of question. They just want both maximum and minimum. It's a um, rational expression, means it's got a fraction. Okay, so try this one on your own. I'll give you about five, seven minutes to do on your own, and then we'll go over it and we'll be done. Okay, so for the derivative, I got 6x over x squared plus 3 quantity squared. Is that what you guys got? Okay. So again, critical values, if it's got a top and a bottom, you set the top equal to 0. You set the bottom equal to 0, but why is that not necessary? The bottom, why is it not necessary to set the bottom equal to 0? But it's that, that's why we need to set it to zero. But in this case, I'm talking about in this case, why do we not need it to set to zero? What what's special about this? Yeah, it's there's no number I can plug in for x. There's no number I can plug in for x here that would give me zero on the bottom. You'd get it. You're you're going to get an imaginary number. Okay. So the only critical value that won't always be the case. By the way, that won't always be the case. But for this one, it is the only critical value. that you get is zero. Okay. 
Okay. So now what I need to do is set up a table, checking the highest point, the lowest point, and um, any critical values. Okay, so the critical values was zero. It only went from negative one to positive one. It was a very small interval. So plug in zero, plug in negative one, plug in one. So if I plug in zero to the original, it's gonna be zero squared over zero squared plus three, right? Which is just zero. And then if I plug in negative one, I get negative one squared over negative one squared plus three, which is one over four, one fourth. And then when I plug in one, what do I get? Same thing, one fourth. So it's got two relative, it's got two absolute max. The two absolute maxes are negative one and positive one, the beginning and end of the interval, and then zero, zero is the absolute minimum because it's the lowest. Okay. All right. So tomorrow we're not, I'm, uh, I'm not going to give you an assignment today. I'm going to let you work on the assignment tomorrow in class. Okay. I don't want to go on too fast. I don't want to go on to the next lesson. So tomorrow there is a, there is an assignment with this, but I'm not going to assign it today. I'm going to assign it tomorrow. The only assignment, there is an assignment that's due by today. So if you haven't finished that, make sure you finish that. That's the only thing that we're going to do. So the new assignment, we'll wait till tomorrow in class. We'll do it. Okay.